Understanding WPSs and PQRs. Gary A. Pace, PE, CWI. As we start diving into this, um, there's basically three documents that we really need to talk about. And welding procedure specification is a WPS. That's the recipe that welders use. Um, a procedure qualification record is a document that shows what we did on our science experiment. And then that backs up our recipe, our WPS. And then we have our welding performance qualification paperwork. This is people. We're qualifying people at this point in time. So that's what we're, we're going to talk about in this um, uh, module, podcast, YouTube presentation. I don't know what this media is. But um, we're going to talk about welding performance qualification, WPQs. What is a PQR? A PQR is the documentation that tells us when we did our science experiment that everything went right. So it would be like us, I guess my, my analogy here is with these pictures, you know, we're gonna try and bake some cookies and we start off with our ingredients, we bake some cookies, and then we write a report that tells how we baked those cookies. But when you're doing a PQR, a procedure qualification record, everything doesn't go right. And you can see sometimes you do a PQR and your bend tests might not go right. You might not get the tensils. And then we end up with a situation where the little potato guy is stabbed down there. But all joking aside, a PQR is just a document that documents our science experiment, what we did what kind of metal we used, what kind of um, filler metal we used, if you're welding it to a code that requires positions, um, AWS D1.1, they want to know what position you're going to weld it in. ASME Section 9 doesn't care. But you're going to keep track of all your essential variables and non-essential variables. Well, not you can keep track of the non-essentials. But all your essential variables need to be addressed on the PQR. But that's what a PQR is, is it's just a document that um, records what you did in your science experiment and whether it worked or whether it didn't. If it didn't work, you're, you're not going to use it and you're going to start over. But that's what a PQR is. A WPS. What is a WPS? Well, a WPS is basically the recipe. We've done our PQR and we've come up with a recipe. We've already cooked the cookies once and everything came out good and we know that if we follow that um, process we're gonna get good cookies every time. So with a WPS we take what we did on the PQR and we make a recipe that the welders are gonna use. It's just a work process. It's instructions. It's a recipe that tells the guy cooking everything, making the cookies, how many eggs, how much flour, how much chocolate chips, whatever. It tells him, hey, I'm going to weld this kind of carbon steel to this kind of stainless steel. I'm going to use this filler material. I'm going to use this shielding gas. I'm going to use this backing gas. I'm This is how this much preheat or um, this is going to be my heat input. You're telling that welder everything that no, needs to go into that document to deposit sound weld metal into that joint. So basically a WPS is just a recipe. There's a lot of organizations that produce and provide codes for welding and construction. 
the American Welding Society, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, the American National Standards Institute, ANSI, American Petroleum Institute, API, American Bureau of Shipping, ABS, Department of Transportation, DOT, military branches, U.S. Army and U.S. Navy. If you're building something for the U.S. Navy, they've got their own set of codes and how they want things done. So keep in mind as you move forward. The American Welding Society supplies a number of codes. Um, the following is a list of some of them. Uh, structural welding steel, AWS D1.1. AWS D1.2 is structural welding aluminum. AWS 1.3 is structural welding sheet steel. This is the same as, not the same as, it's steel, but it is structural steel, sheet steel, that's under an eighth of an inch, I think. You'd need to read the specifications, but I'm pretty sure that it's under an eighth of an inch. AWS D1.1 covers everything above, and then D13 covers everything below. D14 is structural welding of reinforcing steel, rebar. D1.5 is the bridge welding code. D16 is structural welding code for stainless steel. And D19.1 is sheet metal welding code. Sheet metal welding code covers all kinds of different sheet metals. And this is different than D1.5 three because that's structural welding of sheet steel. So you need to keep your codes in mind and if you have any questions look at the front page of a welding code and it'll tell you the scope. D11 and its scope will tell you this is for structural steel. Don't use this code for welding titanium to stainless steel or whatever. I know I pulled a bizarre combination but I pulled it out just to illustrate the point. Structural welding code is structural steel, buildings and things like that. It's not for boilers, piping, pressure vessels. And a lot of people have this misconception that D11 is a catch-all. I had a, early on in my career, I had a design engineer wanting hydraulic cylinders designed to AWS D1.1. And I tried to explain to him, and for the life of me, I could not explain to him that this is not the code for that. And then finally, somebody came up with the idea that our hydraulic cylinders would meet the structural, all the applicable portions of D1.1. And then everybody was happy. But you need to realize that there's different welding codes, and the American Welding Society has this list as well as others for welding codes that they write. The American Society of Mechanical Engineers has a, they put out a lot of information. Um, section one is rules for construction of power boilers. Boil, ASME section two is materials. So this is where all the recipes, I guess, for ferrous material specifications, non-ferrous material specifications, um, part C is specifications for welding rods, electrodes, and filler metals. This is important for the welding inspector. You need to know where to find um, the recipe. What is the specification for E7018? Does the material I have meet up with the specification? And then uh, part D is properties customary and properties metric. Then you've got section three, rules for construction of nuclear facility components. Uh, four is rules for construction of heating boilers. Five is non-destructive examination. It's all the rules on how you do non-destructive examination. Section six is recommended rules for care and operation of heating boilers. So here's some codes and standards. Um, the application of codes and standards that specify qualification requirements for welding include ASME boiler and pressure vessel codes, AWS D1.1 structural welding code, ANSI B31 um, power piping codes. You've got 31.1, 31.3, 31.4, 31.5, 31.6, 31.7, 31.8, 31.9, 31.10, 31.11, 31.12, 31.13, 31.14, 31.15, 31.16, 31.17, 31.18, 31.19
31 whatever and you've got API 1104 standard for welding pipelines and related facilities. This is just four general directions you can go. Each one of these has a specific um, direction or set of criteria for their um, qualification processes. They're all generally the same, but there's some um, specific nuances that go with each one of these. Also, you've got the standard for weld qualification, AWS B2.1 Welding Procedure and Performance Qualification. That's an overall document put out by the AWS that covers, um, you know, the general um, qualification of welding procedures and of welders. Test coupon. Uh, what I want to say here is when we're doing a PQR and we're doing our test coupons, documentation, that's why I got through in this little picture of, you know, stacks of paper. Hopefully your PQR doesn't turn into that, but I've seen some that are pretty healthy. Not quite that bad, but key here is documentation and book work. You got to be somewhat organized when you go down this road because you will get in all kinds of trouble if you are not. So if you've got an assistant that can help you or it's just you, you better figure out, get some file folders and scan things in and make PDF files and get everything in kind of an organized manner because it'll come back to bite you. Um, so when you're doing your test coupon, you want to document everything, you know, keep track of, you know, whatever, the essential and non-essential variables that you need to keep track of while you're doing the, the testing. But key here, documentation. Preparation of a WPS. So this is the general flow chart you're going to follow or your checklist or methodology, I guess, if you're going to do a prepare a WPS. You're going to view, review the job requirements. Um, what code am I going to use? You know, or what is the customer requirements? What metals am I welding? You know, you're going to gather up all this information. What metals am I welding together? What code does it need to be to? What uh, is my customer requirements? Is there any other seismic or, you know, corrosion requirements or any other requirements? You need to look at that job and make sure that you are addressing everything for that weld, for that job, for those materials. Selection of a suitable welding process. You know, not, not every welding process is good for every material. You can't use oxyacetylene welding to weld titanium or hafnium or, you know, reactive metals like that. It's not going to go so well for you. So you got to find a suitable welding process. And usually this goes hand in hand with what does the shop that I'm working at good at. Not Generally not every shop is good at every welding process. That's just my experience. Um, usually every shop has two or three strong points and two or three welding processes where they just don't mess with it. I worked at one place where I was like, why don't we uh, flux core this or why don't we... Uh, stick weld this shielded metal arc and this other welding engineer buddy of mine's like dude we do not do that you would think it would be easy but the guys that are here we do um sub arc and we do gas tungsten arc welding we do not do stick and we do not do flux core because we will just mess it up i was like all right so anyways find a suitable welding process for your shop your customer your client so you can make money you know, all the uh, make sure you got welders that can use that process. Um, then you fill in the suggested format of the PQR. So you kind of rough draft your PQR. What are, what am I going to do? Okay, you fill in the metals and um, filler metals and shielding gases and all the essential variables. You're going to do a rough draft, and then. You're going to come back and double check it. You're going to look in your code. You're going to look in your customer requirements. And you're going to ensure that all the welding variables are covered. Then you're going to make a preliminary WPS on the PQR. A lot of times people want a PWPS. It's a pre, before you even start qualification, the third party inspector or the client or the customer, they want to see what the hell you're doing. If you got a clue as to what you're doing. So you'll submit what's called a, a PWPS, a preliminary WPS. And that's what you're going to work off of when you're out in the shop with your welder um, doing the qualification of your test coupon. So then you're going to go in the shop, and then you're going to weld a coupon 
per your PWPS. You're going to follow the instructions on your rough draft or your WPS. So you're going to weld that coupon out. Once that's done, you're going to heat treat it or whatever, or if it's just as welded, you're going to do your examinations. You're going to shoot your x-rays if you need to. You're going to shoot, um, you're going to do some a visual examination, then you're probably going to do some mechanical testing, usually some tensile tests and some bend tests and, you know, corrosion testing, sometimes impact testing, whatever. And then you're going to write the PQR. As If all those tests come good, you're going to write a PQR from the mechanical test documentation if the results are satisfactory. doesn't do you any good to write a PQR if everything failed, right? So you're going to you're going to put together your PQR, your procedure qualification record from all the mechanical test documentation if the results are satisfactory. Then you're going to go in on your computer and you're going to get in there and you're going to write your final WPS and PQR and you're going to put that documentation together and then you're going to use the WPS in production. Pretty simple, right? Yeah. I wish I had a dollar for every time something went wrong during a qualification. But anyways, that's just part of the game. PQR content. What goes on a PQR? Generally, any supporting documentation. Material specifications, the P numbers, um, electrode specifications, shielding gas specifications, all the required testing, non-destructive testing and destructive. You know, did you shoot x-rays on this, whatever. Corrosion testing. Oh, that would be on the destructive. But all the required testing, non-destructive and destructive. Um, these tests, tests typically include x-rays, ultrasonic, tensile, bend testing, and impact testing. So whatever your code requires, your customer requires, and all your essential variables, those need to be addressed on the PQR. And you need to have supporting documentation. It's like writing a lab report. You know, when you're in high school biology, you're just writing what you did and what you used. You know, I, I did this science experiment. I added this much baking soda to this much hydrochloric acid. Things caught on fire. Whatever. You're just writing down what you did and what you used to achieve those results. And then you're going to send your test coupon off to the lab. They're going to do some testing and send it back to you with a report. They're not going to send the test coupon back. They're going to send you a report saying, yep, everything passed, or nope, everything failed. You need to start over. So that's the contents of a PQR. Okay, when we're talking about qualification of welders and then WPSs and PQRs, there's a wall. Don't confuse the two sides of the wall. Um. Because I, I stole this from uh, Walt Spurko, who's the chairman of ASME Section 9. He gave me his blessings. I told him I was going to borrow his material. And he was good with it. Um, you've got a wall. you got procedures on one side and personnel on another. And a lot of people get focused in, well, my welder isn't qualified to that procedure. I qualified him to another procedure. No, welders generally don't qualify to a specific procedure. You qualify to a specific process and a, a specific filler material. You don't qualify generally, oh, he can only weld with this procedure. Because then you'd get bogged down in a paperwork nightmare, right? Imagine how much trouble it would be to try and produce um, welders that were qualified to hundreds of different welder um, WPSs company I worked for, we had dozens and dozens of um, welding procedures for 7018 alone. And they were all written for different customers and there was all kinds of craziness on it. But our welders, you give them one test and they're, they're covered for all that stuff. Because there's only five or six uh, essential variables in a welder when you qualify a welder. Whereas a procedure in a PQR, there can be any number of essential variables and non-essential variables. So you got to you got to get back to this wall. You got to keep the personnel qualifications on one side, the welder quals on one side, and the procedures and the PQRs on the other, and you don't crisscross these. A PQR supports the WPS. 
It is the supporting documentation. One QR can support one WPS. It can go this way. You can have just one to one ratio. You don't need, you know, it doesn't always go this way, but you can have one PQR that can support one WPS. A PQR supports more than one WPS. So one PQR can support multiple WPSs. I had I worked for a company and we had probably, I don't know, 25 WPSs, welding procedure specifications, that were all pretty much the same, but they had one PQR that supported them. It, this was to weld a certain kind of carbon steel with 7018 and we had a stack of these WPSs and they were all pretty much the same but every time we'd submit them to a, a new client the new client would want something changed so we just got sick of having you know one having to change it because if you change it for that guy then you got to get everybody else to review his changes well they might not want those changes and it might be something and I'm going to use a kind of a stupid example but maybe client a wanted you know special stainless steel brushes that were from lithuania and they wanted that used on their um welds you know what i mean or they wanted theirs splashed with holy water drawn out of a certain well in the you know the mountains of kazakhstan or something you know there would be something specific that that um client wanted done on that WPS so we just write it for them and we just use it for their product line um, so it, but it all went back to the same PQR the same PQR supported these 25 WPSs we didn't requalify a, a different WPS to support those welds we had already done it they said yeah you guys can do this this is how we want our WPS and we went from there so you can have one PQR that supports multiple WPSs. You can go the other way where you've got multiple PQRs supporting one WPS. So this would be a situation where, let's say I had I started out with 7018 and my original PQR, I just did a plain Jane, we just did tensile tests and bend tests and we called it good. Well, then we have a client that comes along and says, hey, we like that, but we want you to add something to it. We want to get some impact testing done on that. So can you do another PQR and add that to the WPS? All right. So we revised the WPS. So not, then we just we went from just having, you know, having it done with um, just a plain Jane as well to procedure qualification record to one with impact testing. Well, then somebody else comes along and says, hey, we'd like you to heat treat ours. So can we get a PQR that has heat treatment? So then you write, you write that up. So you can have you know things getting tacked on here as you move along. You just add supporting PQRs to it. So you know this can get pretty ugly with, you know, um, you can have multiple PQRs supporting one WPS, and these can get really, really ugly. And I say that when I say ugly, I mean it can get complicated. Um, you'll have you know three supporting PQRs supporting one WPS, and then to dig through them and make sure every essential variable's been addressed and all that, it's it can get interesting. So you can have multiple PQRs supporting a WPS. Pre-qualified WPS. A pre-qualified WPS doesn't require a supporting PQR. I'll probably have to do a whole nother slideshow presentation on pre-qualified WPSs. But I'll just cover it here on this slide real quick. Um, a pre-qualified welding procedure specification uses known variables that have a long history of making sound welds and require no testing. A written procedure is required for all pre-qualified WPSs. So what's this telling us? It's telling us that there are codes like AWSD 1.1, structural steel, which is carbon steel. They have a list of materials that are your garden variety, plain Jane, carbon structural steels, that if you weld them within the boundaries of what 
AWS D1.1 has said you should weld them with. They've kind of got this little recipe checklist that you go through. And if you follow it and you follow all those their rules for those for welding that metal to that metal with that filler metal and you follow their rules, you're not going to mess it up. It's been done for 80 years using, you know, 7018 to weld A36 that not everybody on the planet needs to requalify this. If you just follow these rules and you write down what you're going to do, you got to have it written down. You can't just go out there and weld it and say, well, this is pre-qualified. I already looked it up. No, you need to have it written down so the welders have a P WPS to follow. You just don't have a PQR to back it up. So I'll make another video and we'll get crazy about pre-qualified WPSs. Here's an example of an AWS D1.1 pre-qualified weld procedure. Um, you can see this is the standard form. You can get it out of uh, the AWS D1.1. You can use another um, format. You're not stuck with this one. This is just kind of a general run-of-the-mill uh, procedure. And you can see that you can use it either as pre-qualified, qualified by testing, or um, as a PQR. So you just check the boxes on you know what type of document you're going to use. This can be a procedure qualification record. You check the procedure qualification record up top. Or it can be a WPS, and in that case you check whether it's pre-qualified or qualified by testing. But if this is a like I said here is an example of a pre-qualified procedure. We don't need to do testing. We're just going to go through AWS D1.1, you know, the pre-qualified section, which is um, Clause 3. Um, used to be sections, but then it got confused with ASME, the um, American Society of Mechanical Engineers. They call their stuff by sections. So the American Welding Society calls theirs clauses, which is like a chapter. But anyways... I digress. Um, with a pre-qualified procedure, you just go through um, clause three, and you know you pick out your weld metal, you pick out your base metal, you pick out your positions, your shielding gas, whatever is appropriate for those pre-qualified weld processes, like shield and metal arc welding. So if everything falls within the parameters of clause three, you have yourself a pre-qualified weld procedure. But this is what the form looks like. Welder qualification. It's the range of approval is not as restrictive for welder qualification as for procedure testing. Welder qualification has fewer essential variables than procedure qualification testing. One welder performance qualification can cover many WPSs. Here's a little bit of terminology. This is some important stuff when you're dealing with WPSs and PQRs. It took me a while to figure out essential, non-essential, and supplementary essential. So for essential variables, that is a, a parameter that when changed outside its permitted range requires requalification. That would be something like the base material. If you change the base material from a carbon steel to titanium, and I know that's an extreme example, you've changed an essential variable, you got to requalify. If I change the welding process, if I go from stick welding to submerged arc welding, I've changed the welding process. I need to requalify the procedure. That's an essential variable. Um, so these things have to be addressed. You have to address all the essential variables. And then I'm talking ASME section nine. Um, for ASME Section 9, you need to address all the essential variables on both the WPS and the PQR. Um, a supplementary essential variable is an essential variable only when impact testing is required. So if you're doing some kind of cryogenic situation where they want all the material impact tested or you're going up to put something in the Arctic and impact testing is really important, then supplementary essential variables are are required and you need to address all of those. And impact testing, for those of you that don't know what it is, you cut a little sample out of your test coupon and you put it in a device. This would be a Sharpie impact um, test. There's an IZOD there 
listed. Most of the stuff I've ever dealt with is Sharpie impact tests. But you deal, you put it in there, you whack it, and it gives you an impact strength, how much energy that particular um, piece of material was able to absorb. Um, in regards to non-essential variables, non-essential variables are things like, um, let's say, the size of the filler metal. Let's say I qualify a weld procedure on with gas metal arc welding, and I switch from 035 wire diameter to 045 wire diameter. I haven't really changed anything um, super ultra important in regards to deposition of sound weld metal. But if I change that, I just need to change it on the WPS, on the recipe that I give the welder. It's an important um, variable, but it's a non-essential variable. I don't have to go back and requalify the whole procedure. I just need to change it on the WPS. Maybe I revise it to add a different um, size of filler material. Or if I qualified a weld procedure with um, eighth inch 7018, and then I wanted to use 530 seconds in um, regards to uh, production, then I wouldn't have to requalify it. I would just have to um, revise the procedure to say, hey, the welder is allowed to do this. So those are three terms, essential variables, non-essential variables, and supplementary essential variables that are really important. And if you're going to be writing WPSs and PQRs, you probably should get a handle on them. On this slide, you can see I've um, we talked about essential, supplementary, essential, and non-essential. Well, for like let's say for gas tungsten and arc welding, this is from ASME section nine. You can see where I've pulled up the little grid there or the little chart. So you can see the essential variables and supplementary, essential, and non-essential. So when I write a WPS, I have to put everything that's a, an essential and a non-essential. So um, I need to address on a WPS, I need to address all those little check marks. Every little check mark, I got to say if I did it or didn't. So, like for let's say for method of back gouging, I'd put in there um, grinding and cutting or grinding and abrasive wheels or whatever, chipping, use of a blowtorch or use of uh, carbon arc gouging, what, and I know those are extreme examples, and you probably wouldn't use those on a, on a method of back gouging for a TIG weld. But I'm throwing it out there. You need to address it. You need to have something written down that address it. Or you just say none. We're not going to back gouge. Um, method of cleaning is another biggie. You don't have to address that on the PQR because it's not, there's no check mark there under essential, Right? But you have to, it's purple, so it has to be on the WPS. It's over in that purple row. Um, so method of cleaning, you'd put that, you know, um, grinding, wire brushes, use only stainless steel, use acetone, um, use specific cleaning methods. Don't use um, carbon steel brushes to contaminate the stainless steel. Whatever you want to put in there, you just have to address it. Um, orifice and cup size. So these all are um, the non-essential variables. They are, a lot of them are instructions to the welder so that the welder can make a um, sound weld deposit utilizing your process. And he's not wandering all over saying, well, orifice and cup size, I can use anything I want. No, you're saying you can use this orifice and this cup size that's it. Um, stringer or weave bead. Nope, I don't want to weave. I want a stringer this wide or, you know, electrode spacing or whatever you've got. Peening. Generally, any ones I've ever seen have been no peening. I've never run across peening. It's obviously out there because they listed it, but, you know, for when weld procedure I ever wrote it, I just, no peening. Just in case somebody was thinking of peening it. But, um, and, or for like electrical characteristics, you know, the type of tungsten electrode, but I'm kind of getting off track here. Supplementary essential variables, you can see there's only four of those that you'd add for impact testing, heat input, and the current or polarity. You know, those aren't, you don't have to address those on the 
um, you know, if you don't have impact testing on the PQR. But if you're doing a PQR where you have, you know, there's going to be impact testing, you have to address all those supplementary essential variables. So I hope this kind of sorts out the essential, supplementary essential, and non-essential variable vocabulary alphabet soup for you. On this slide, you can see the GMAW weld procedure, essential, supplementary essential, and non-essential variables. Um, in all codes, you're gonna, they have different formats for telling you what your essential, supplementary, and non-essential variables are. But when you're qualifying a weld procedure, you need to look at the code you're qualifying it to and what the code requirements are. What are the variables you need to keep track of on the PQR, the WPS, and how you need to explain those and document them. The different codes have different requirements. GTAW weld procedure variables. Um, we've got a couple of slides, like I've said, that I've showed, we're going to show that, um, you know, it's just the welding variables for specific processes that you need to document on WPSs and PQRs when you're doing a procedure qualification. So you've got essentials, supplementary essential, and non-essential variables. And these are going to vary from process to process. The Essential variables for submerged arc welding are not the same essential variables for shielded metal arc welding or gas tungsten arc welding. And they're not all going to be the same from code to code. So you just need to be cognizant that somewhere in each code there is a weld procedure variable table that's going to tell you what you need to address to put together a proper procedure qualification record and welding procedure specification. So essential, supplementary essential, and non-essential variables. And not all codes use the same terminology, but it's pretty much the same. Essential, non-essential, and sometimes you got supplementary essential. Welding procedure specification. The welding procedure specification is a required document for all code welding. Your customer either directly or indirectly specifies to what code your company must qualify. The WPS outlines all of the parameters required to perform your welding operation. In short, the WPS is the recipe for welding operations. It describes the welding process or processes used, the base materials used, the joint design and geometry, gases, flow rates, welding position, and includes all of the process conditions and variables. Each code has a recommended format but you don't have to follow the recommended format. If you want to come up with your own format, that is totally cool. You can run with that. But there are recommended formats and it kind of gives you a good starting point. Recommended, not required. You can see here's a suggested format for welding procedure specifications. You don't have to follow this. You have to address all the essential and non-essential variables, but you don't have to follow this format. You can invent your own format if you want. Nothing says you have to follow the suggested format. They give you an idea. Yeah, this is one that works for a lot of people. You want to use it, run with it. If not, invent your own. I worked at a couple of places where they had everything written out and it was in paragraph format and they addressed everything. And the, it wasn't in a grid or kind of a table layout like this. It was in paragraphs. And there was a couple of little tables in there about materials and whatnot. But it was a completely different format. Completely legal. Clients liked it because it addressed everything and everything was written down and there was no way to get around it. One of the problems with welding procedures and PQRs also, that people that aren't really initiated into the craft have problems with is that they'll end up thinking they have to fill in every blank on the WPS or PQR. You don't have to fill in every blank. You just need to look in the code and address certain variables, the essential and non-essential variables that need to be addressed depending on what you're, you got going on. 
WPS, you have to address essential and non-essential, and a PQR, you just need to address the essential. You can address the non-essential variables on a PQR, but, but anyways, just because there's a blank there doesn't mean you have to put information in there, because it's probably going to get kicked back if the reviewer knows what he's doing. It's going to ask, why did you put this here? What does this mean? This doesn't have anything to do with what you're doing. So some, some procedures, some welding processes have variables that other um, processes don't. Shielding gas. Shielded metal arc does not have shielding gas. Gas tungsten arc welding does. So you have gas. Not as a shielded metal arc, if you're writing a shielded metal arc welding procedure, don't address shielding gas. So that's the advice or the rant for the welding procedure specification. Here's an example of what uh, an uh, ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, welding procedure specification would look like. Um, once again, you don't have to use their suggested format. This is just a starting place. I've worked at different organizations that had stuff that was, their documentation was completely different for welding procedure specifications. So um, just as long as you address all the variables and get all the information that's required on there, you can use whatever format you want. As long as you can track it and your customer can figure out what's going on and it's in some sort of legible format. As long as you address everything, you can use it. But this is the general format that is used by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. The procedure qualification record is the document that qualifies the welding procedure specification. This is a supporting document. In order to qualify your WPS, a procedure qualification plate is welded to the code requirements, the code you're using. The actual test parameters are recorded at the time of welding to ensure the WPS was being followed. So you have to record all of the essential variables when you are welding your test coupon or your test plate. And then you send the PQR off to the lab and then they're going to do some bend tests, some tensile tests, some corrosion tests, whatever needs to be addressed, whatever physical tests need to be done, the lab is going to do them. They're going to send you back a stack of results for your mechanical testing, tensils, bends, whatever, and then you're going to take that and you're going to write a PQR. When you're done writing the PQR, you're going to write a WPS. That's how the system works. The PQR combines all of the information of the WPS and adds the test results to provide a complete document that certifies the welding specification. This document is also required by all codes unless you are qualifying under the American Welding Society specifications. Under certain conditions, the WPS may be considered pre-qualified in which the PQR is not required. You can do this under special conditions, but you have to follow all of the rules to do it under the American Welding Society specifications such as D11 structural steel. You have to use a certain type of filler metal, certain base metals are qualified, certain shielding gases at certain amps, volts, and travel speeds, and certain joint designs. You have to follow their recipe and you do need to write it down. You can't just say this is pre-qualified, I'm going to run with it. It does not work like that. You need to make sure that it is all written down and that you have addressed all the essential variables of that pre-qualification clause of the code. This is an ASME Section 9 suggested format for procedure qualification record. You go through here and for ASME Section 9 you address all the essential variables and if you want to address non-essential variables you can. You do not need to fill in every blank on here. If you fill in every blank, you're going to get yourself into trouble. Um, if you don't do something, do not put NA, like post-weld heat treatment. Use the word none. If you did not use post-weld heat treatment, put none. Don't put NA. 
it is applicable, and you just didn't do it. None. None is better than N.A. Um, a lot of times when you're sending these in for review, somebody is going to look at it and say, he put N.A., he should have put none. You need to put none. So um, don't fill in all the blanks. Make sure and do uh, address all the essential variables, and you shouldn't have too many problems. Once again, you don't have to use this format. It is recommended, suggested. You can use something else if you would like. This one works for a lot of people. Maybe it doesn't work for you. You don't like it. You don't like the colors. You don't like the lines, whatever. You can invent your own format and go with that. As long as you address all the essential variables, you are good to go. Typical format. Um, once again, so you can see I've kind of outlined over here on the back page. This is where you put in all your um, guided bend tests, your tensile tests, other tests. Um, you know, you just fill this out um, and you sign it at the bottom. You know, you're the manufacturer, the date and all that. And you're, with this, you're going to staple to it your um, whatever you got back from the lab that, you know, supports this. So this is you know the where you the that second page the main thing i'm trying to point out here is that second page is where you're going to put in all your information in regards to your mechanical testing um your your bend tests your tensile tests chemical tests whatever kind of testing you had done that generally goes on the second page the first page is all your essential variables and non-essential variables that you utilized in welding out that test coupon what goes on a PQR? What's the information that you need to provide in a procedure qualification record? Well, generally any supporting documentation, material specifications, electrode specifications, shielding gas specifications, all required testing, non-destructive testing, destructive testing. These te tests typically include x-ray examinations, ultrasonic examinations, tensile testing, bend testing, and when required, impact testing. Might have chemical testing in there too, corrosion resistance. There's a lot of different things that you can have on here. But a PQR is going to, you need to hit all the essential variables for whatever code you're working to, and then with the required examinations. You need, you're putting together a case, court of law type thing. You're putting together a document that is going to support your WPS. You can't have any holes in this. This needs to be tight. This needs to be airtight. So you need to include all that information. All the information that is required by your code or your customer specifications and requirements and documents, they all need to be in a PQR. Okay, here's a, an example of a plate test coupon. I snagged this from... Um, the U.S. Navy, they've got, I don't know, they've got their codes and standards and how they want everything done. So this is in the public domain, so I poached it. But anyways, I digress. Um, so from here, you can see we've got our test coupon. Usually these things are, you know, about 12 inches long. They can be longer, whatever. Um, it, different codes have different um, specifications in regards to uh, how they want their coupons the lengths the thicknesses whatever so but and this one tells you where you need to you know cut your pieces out of um you can see we've got you know the discard then you got a re reduced section tensile you get your side bends a sharpie impacts um they tell you where to take the 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 different mechanical test pieces out of your um test coupon I usually, when I would send off a test coupon um, to a lab, I would write up very specifically in a letter what I wanted done, what code, you know, everything. You know, put together about a two-page letter where you're like, I want it tested to this, 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 and then I want this additional testing, and, you know, I want it written on this kind of paper or whatever your specifications are. But anytime I communicate with a test lab, I would very specifically send them a letter 
you know, and after you've done this a few times, your letter is just more or less cut and paste. But, you know, hey, I want, you know, this kind of testing, this kind of testing, I want this done. And then it kind of confuses the he said, she said, you attach that with your purchase order and you send it off. But anyways, most codes have a section like this, a little sketch in there where it tells you where where to cut out the different parts of, you know, the different mechanical test pieces. When we talk about mechanical testing, we're generally talking about um, a bend test and a tensile test. Those That's the baseline of the mechanical testing world. And then from there, you can get into all kinds of, you know, uh, different types of impact testing or hardness testing or, you know, there's just a whole menagerie of, you know, different um, kinds of mechanical tests, depending on the code, the client, the situation, um, you know, depending on what your project is, where it is, something in the Arctic is definitely going to be a different set of rules in regards to um, welding and materials joining than something that you're putting together to throw on the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico or, you know, let's say an icebreaker or, you know, there's just so many different variables and environmental situations that go into this in regards to um, materials and materials testing and mechanical testing. So, but generally, you know, this is the starting point. Most welds, most codes call for a, you know, a bend test and a tensile test. So that's generally the starting point from the mechanical testing. Okay, summary of what we have on the WPS and PQRs. You know, we talked about what a PQR is, what's a WPS. We talked about codes and standards, um, how important they are. We talked about the test coupon, preparation of a WPS, PQR content, mechanical testing. We covered a lot of ground there, but... I guess the bottom line is read the code that you're going to qualify the WPS and the PQR to. Read your customer requirements and any of it, any other uh, information that can be gleaned that you're going to need and requirements. And you go from there. You're going to acquire your material and then it's going to be documentation and paperwork. One of the keys to this WPS PQR thing is documentation and paperwork. This is the stuff that will kill you every time. Um, you just got to be diligent and you got to be a good bookkeeper and keep track of this stuff. So get some file folders and go from there. Hope this has been helpful. Questions, comments, um, you know where to find me. Um, hopefully this has been useful. Um, see what we can do in the future. Take care.